Well, good morning, Restore Church. How are we this morning? Oh, come on. You need some more coffee. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Y'all need some coffee. And Jesus, we're going to have some fun today. I'm excited about it. My name is Adam Barnes. I'm the lead pastor. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here with you today. And uh, I, I said it several times the last couple of weeks. I just want to say it again. Thank you so much for being flexible as we made some adjustments to being down here in this unusual space. Um, and uh, as, uh, as we've been working through our uh, flooding situation up at the uh, worship center. And I'll give you some more updates on what that looks like in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, well, in a couple weeks, not right now. Um, we're still working on it, and uh, we'll, we'll get back up there as soon as possible. So thank you for being flexible in this unusual space. Um, this is a prayer house, and maybe you've never heard me say this before, but uh, we purchased this property from the Korean church, and the Korean church built this building. Uh, this building is called the Octagon. It also houses our um, uh, our office space. And so um, this building was created initially to be a prayer house. Uh, this was a room that folks would come in, they'd take off their shoes, they would eat a meal, and they would head down one of two wings. One to the right, this would be the men, and that to the right, to the left, yes, left, would be the the women and each one of the windows down those uh, down those each of those hallways were a eight four by eight room where there was a chair and a Bible in there and they would have twenty four seven prayer coming out of this building and so we're continuing to work off the prayers of the saints. I love telling that story so people know that we're continuing uh, to in this in spite of our circumstances to to work off the prayer of the saints that have gone on before. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, but for being flexible. Uh, we started a series called Follow Jesus, and I want to challenge us as a church in this situation, in this circumstance or setting, uh, to help us grow in our faith, uh, to mature, to grow, um, and, and not to stay stagnant. Um, in fact, when we were praying about this, I was not planning on doing this series right now, but given the circumstance of being down here, it just felt like God was, this is a unique situation for us to mature, for us to grow, uh, and uh, I don't want you to stay stuck in your old life and your old way of doing things, uh, and I, I want you to grow in your faith. In fact, we want to connect people to an authentic and life-giving relationship with Jesus, making fully devoted followers of Christ. That's why we're here. That's what we do, and uh, I want to help you grow in your faith journey. So we've started, we're starting the sermon series called follow Jesus. Last week, we answered the question, how do I know I'm saved? There are people that walk around, Christians struggle with the idea, of like, oh, I don't know if I'm saved or not. You may wrestle with that doubt uh, back and forth. Um, but we, we answered that question last week, and there are multiple ways you can be assured. You can know that you know that you know that you're saved. And uh, um, this week, I want to answer the question, uh, who am I in Christ? This is really an identity issue. This is really a, an identity conversation. And, uh, and, and, and there are people that live their life, call themselves Christians, but I don't know that their identity really is as a Christ follower. Like they call themselves Christians, but I don't know if they realize the identity that they have in Christ, who they are in Christ. Identity is a big conversation now in society. It's a big topic, and it's all kinds of confused. And we can be uh, assured of who God created us to be and uh, who we are in Christ. And so I want to remind you or tell you who you are in Christ and, and, and let you know that he's got some incredible things for you. Discipleship, it's what we talk about. It's the process we talk about following Jesus, growing in your faith. There are two parts to discipleship. One is information. There's information for you to be a follower of Jesus. In fact, Jesus taught uh, on the hillsides. He went into towns and taught. He taught in synagogues. He began to teach. He taught the disciples something. And, and information is important. It's it's uh, knowing that Christ came to set you free and died for you, knowing that there's information, that, that the scripture has information is important. It's powerful. There's also the, the, a part of discipleship that is transformation. And uh, transformation is, is, is what we want to see in our lives. We want to see this. Information is pow powerful, but it becomes transformational when you figure out how to live out the information that you have. If you're trying to start a diet plan or trying to get healthy, it's powerful to have the information, but it's another thing to actually live it out. It's, it's one thing in your life to know about Christ. It's another thing to live out a purpose and calling and plan for he, that he has for you in relationship with him. And so today, I want to talk to you. I want to remind you about who you are in Christ. I want you to know that there are some big things that God says about you, uh, that he's not done working on, your, on you yet, and he has a plan and purpose for your life. In fact, I want you to know that there, that there are a few things that God views you as. He views you as a few things. One, you're loved. Amen. You're loved. Like, that's a big deal. You may come out, you may live your life thinking that no one loves you, and that's not true. The world may not love you. You may not love you, but God loves you. 
In fact, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He cr started creation out of love, and he created us in his image. And, and scripture continues, says that, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, who we're talking about, Jesus. And so I want you to know right off the bat that you are loved. That's where your identity is anchored in, that you're loved. Not only are you loved, but you're adopted. What does that mean? That you were, you were brought into the family of God. You weren't part of his family. You were separated from a relationship with him. We've all been separated from a relationship with him. But now when we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, when we're in Christ, we become adopted. We are, God views us as adopted sons and daughters of, uh, of him. We're his children. We're, we're, we're viewed as adopted. We're also viewed as forgiven. Like, you may not forgive you. You may not see you as forgiven. In fact, you may see yourself as condemned over and over again, and you may be condemning yourself in your mind. When you look in the mirror, you don't see forgiven. You can't smile at yourself. You can't love yourself. But God sees you in Christ as forgiven. Oh, man, now we're, now we're, we're talking about something. Okay, not only does he see you as forgiven, but he sees you as redeemed. Whoa. Not only are you forgiven, but you're redeemed. Christ has has bought you back from the forces of sin and evil that once owned you and controlled you. Do you know that you're also viewed as chosen? <laughs> Scripture says that you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What? He says that all about you. God views you this way. Our creator views us this way. This is important. This is the premise on, on how we begin to see ourselves, how we begin to understand who we are in Christ. Because what Christ has done for us, who, how we see ourselves is really a big deal. It changes us. It changes how we operate. When I was a young tyke, I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, 11 years old. My cousin joined uh, the Naval Academy. He played football for Navy on the special teams. And I remember I was so proud of my cousin. And I, uh, I, I, I now have grown to be more affectionate towards Army. And, uh, um, but I, I remember watching him. And I, I remember going to the Naval Academy and, like, just being in awe. And I, I went to my dad. And I'm like, Dad, can we, I, I want to buy a PT uniform. Can I buy a PT uniform, please? Can I get a uniform? Can I get a uniform? Can I get a uniform? All day long, can I get a uniform? And so I bought this uniform, put it on, I put a hat on, we got this looking all snazzy in these whites, dress whites, and I'm walking around, and I pretended that I was in the, the Navy. I, I pretended I was in it. And I like, I, I couldn't convince anybody that I was in. I tried my best to convince people that I was in, but I wasn't really in. Now, I did join the Army. I, I, did, I did get in. My identity as a soldier there, like that, they framed me. They changed things. There was like, you go through a whole process of boot camp to change who you were, that you're no longer Johnny on the block, that you are, you are U.S. Army. That's who you are. That, there's, a, there's a changing of the process. In fact, you can't even take off the uniform. You can't, if it's off, if you take off the uniform, you're still a soldier. If you're in civilian clothes, you're still a soldier. And so something changes when you begin to identify that way. You begin to understand who you are. Something changes spiritually when you understand who you are. I want to talk to you a little bit about the power that you have, who you are in Christ, what this means for your life. Because I think sometimes we as Christians walk around in weak form. Yep. Our prayers are weak. Our belief is weak. Our faith is weak. We walk around struggling when we ought not to be struggling. You've got power living on the inside of you. You've got the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in you. Things ought to be different. Okay, so what, I, what I'm talking about, that if we can begin to recognize this and receive this, then that means that my identity in Christ is different. So I want to I talk to you about Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. I love what Paul begins to set the stage in Romans. He writes an incredible letter. He's a, he's a, he's a legal writer. He has some incredible insight, both spiritually and practically. In Romans chapter 5, he says this. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so... Also, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through dis the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. 
All right, let me pause right there and help you all out because that's really a whole lot of legal term, a whole lot of uh, theological head knowledge, but I want to I wanna help you simplistically. If you could put that chart up on there for me, that would be great. On this chart, they'll break it down the scripture this way. Many of us recognize that there was, there were, there was the, the man that's being talked about here um, is Adam, the initial, the first man here, the first man that caused trespasses to result in the condemnation for all people. When Adam was created, one man entered the, uh, through one man, sin entered the world. There, through his disobedience, not following what God instructed, it made us all sinners. We all, uh, we all inherit that. We all are, live in a fallen world. Now, some of you are like, that's not fair. Why do I get to pay the consequences for what Adam did? Well, let me tell you, if it was just you in the garden, you would have probably done the same thing. If it was me in the garden, I would have probably done the same thing. So let's not give a whole, Adam a whole lot of heat. Let's begin to recognize that through one man, there were problems enter the world. We also recognize that through one man, Jesus, who's fully God, and fully man, we recognize both of those aspects that and through his obedience that we are made righteous. God made us righteous. What does that mean? He also provided justification for you and life for all. Justification is this word. It's a theological term that is just as if I've never sinned. Meaning you stand before the judge. It'd be like you getting before a judge and the judge's like, all right, what, what are you charged with? And your lawyer stands up to you and says, stands up for you and says, um, nothing. There's no charges. The prosecution doesn't, isn't there. There's no charges. There's no charges. He, t- he took on your pain, your sin, your guilt for you. There's no charges. Just as if you never sinned. Okay. So the problem is, is that we, we struggle with this concept um, of, of, of doing. Of doing. Um. Oftentimes when we meet someone, we, the first question we ask is, hey, so what do you do? I do this all the time. Hey, what do you do? I, I get to know a person by what they do. Problem is, is when we begin to, to make what we do our identity. And I, I wrestle with that. I, I mean, people think my first name is Pastor. I, mean, I, I live and breathe being a pastor. I love it. I've do, I, 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 I worked other jobs, and I couldn't help but pastoring people in random places. I was a police officer a little while. I, worked, I did all kinds of different jobs, and I, I just couldn't help but pastoring people. And so I, I, I the, but, but the reality of it is, is I'm, I'm first something else. I'm first a son. I'm first something else. I want to remind you that you're first something else. It's not, not about what you do or don't do. It's about who you are. And who you are isn't about who you say you are. It's about what God says who you are. And so when, you, when you're in Christ, when, 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 you're, when you're anchored in him, when, you've, uh, when you are in relationship with Christ, something changes, something shifts in you. And so oftentimes we begin to live our Christian lives of this struggle back and forth of I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. And it's this constant back and forth. Well, the problem is, is we, we anchor that, anchor who we are out of an identity of us struggling or wrestling. And the reality of it is, is Christ doesn't struggle with who you are. You ought not to struggle with who you are. And it's out of knowing who you are that are empowered for you to do the things that God's called you to do. We'll talk about this. Why? Because we, as Romans says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, we live by faith. We have a relationship with God by faith. And so I can, look, look, your sin and shame and guilt and cycles and sin cycles are, aren't more powerful than righteousness, are more powerful than the cross, are more powerful. Your addiction isn't more powerful than, than, than God. And so as you place your, your trust in him, he begins to change something inside of you. And so... I'm here to remind you that who you are in Christ is this, and this is important. In Christ, you are righteous. You're, what does righteous mean? You are in right standing. You're in good standing. I'm credentialed with the Assemblies of God, and every year I have to, to report back to the Assemblies of God uh, my status and where I'm at, and they begin to affirm that I'm still in good standing, and the district affirms you're in good standing. And so there's this validation that I, I'm, I'm in good standing with the district, I'm in good standing with national leadership, I'm in good standing. You're in good standing. You're in good standing with God. Now listen, not on your own strength, not on your own ability. You, none of us, in our, we're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God, but in Christ I am righteous, and that is powerful. That is powerful. In Christ, in fact, in Christ, 
through Christ's obedience, it says, it says this, through the obedience of one man, meaning Christ, many will be made righteous. Righteous. I am righteous. If you're taking notes, number two, the, the second thing that who you are in Christ is this. You are a new creation. Y'all, this should change something about the way you think about the world, how you interact with the world. You are a new creation. Christians think they get saved and they're the same old, same old. But pastor, I still got the same old struggles and still the same old temptations and the same old things. That doesn't mean the same old you. You're new in Christ. You're a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone away. The new is here. The new is here. And so if you're in Christ, your identity is a new creation. Now, do you always do the, 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 the new creation behavior? No. But Christianity isn't about behavior modification. Your behavior changes the closer you get to becoming like Jesus. Things change the closer to, to your relationship with God you become. In fact, God created you in his image, he said. Then there was the fall. The fall happened. We were, we, we've been separated in relationship with God. And through Christ, his work on the cross and resurrection and in a relationship with Christ, we have been made redeemed, restored. We're made new. And so I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you that you're a new creation. Sometimes that means your thoughts should challenge your thoughts. Your thoughts should challenge your, uh, your temptations. The Spirit should challenge your thoughts. The Spirit should challenge your temptations. The Spirit should begin to remind you that you're a new creation. We should be able to remind each other that you're a new creation. That's not how, that's, this isn't bringing condemnation. That's not how we act. No, the Spirit should lead to conviction inside of you. You're a new creation. What's that mean for your prayer life? What's that mean for your devotions? What's that mean for the people around you? What does that mean for your marriage? What does that mean for the calling and purpose that God has on you? That you are a new creation. How about this one? Number three, I'm a saint, not a sinner. If you're in Christ, the label that you have over you is no longer a sinner. Now, does that mean you don't sin? No. Scripture is very clear that if you say you are without sin, then you're a liar <laughs> and you sinned. Right? But it says, it's, it, the implication here is not that you're not a sinner, or not that you've not sinned, it's that you're not a sinner. It's not the label you wear over your life. It's not what keeps you under. It means, it means like this. Some type people wear this label of sinner over their lives. They're like, oh, I'm just always going to have an addiction. I'm never going to beat it. I'm always going to lie. I'm never going to get over it. I'm always going to have these struggles. I'm never going to be able to defeat it. I'm always going to live this life. It's always going to be this way. And so that label sinner just begins to keep you that way instead of you beginning to grow or mature. Listen, I, I uh, was blown up in a roadside bomb. I could live under the label as a disabled veteran with a brain injury and a back injury. I could live my life non-functional. I could live at the VA. I could live not supporting my family. I could live not functioning as a pastor. I could. But in Christ, I've received healing. In Christ, I've received purpose. In Christ, I'm walking out the calling he has for me. I no longer live under those labels. You no longer have to live under the label as a sinner. That, what does that mean? It calls you up higher. It calls you up higher. I mean, think about it. Think about this. Think about this. When you were a kid, when you were going at family meals, did you have the kids' table and the adults' table? Okay. So growing up, we still had the same thing. And my in-laws, we had the same thing with the kids' table and adult table. And then there becomes a year. I don't know what year that is, but some year is, is like the magical moment where you no longer have to sit at the kids' table. You're called up to the, to the adults' table. And you get an adult cup size. You get adult plates. And you actually get a place at the table. And, and, and it, some of you are still waiting for that moment. I'm sorry it hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> but 
But you get, there's this movement. It's calling you up higher. It's to function higher. And listen, God's not keeping you as a sinner so you continue to function and stay doing things that you ought not to be doing. He's calling you a saint so that you help lead others out of a pit that you once were in. And so I want to challenge you and encourage you as followers of Jesus that you are these things in Christ. You are these things in Christ. I am. Um, I was thinking um, about, uh, when I was preparing the sermon, I was thinking about an orange. And I, I read this week of that the cost of oranges are going up. I almost brought an egging, but I, it was too expensive. I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and so I, 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 uh, I heard that oranges are going up. And I, I began to do a little bit of research about uh, oranges and understanding that um, navel oranges are, this is a navel orange, they're not really naturally this way. Navel oranges are made this way. They're grafted this way. There's no seeds in them. They're sweet. Um, they're, they're, they're extra juicy. And um, they're, they're made specifically and they're grafted in. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about what that means. The, the, the farmer would take a little sapling, a little s- a sprout that's, uh, you know, 12 inches to a couple of 18 inches high. It would take that sprout and then it would, then it would cut a, 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 a tea in it. Cut a tea in it. It would take um, from the, the uh, a little piece from the, the, the item that you would want to merge it with. That you would the pr- type of fruit you would want it to produce, like this a sweet fruit, and you begin to put that in the the sapling or the sprout, and then you tie it together and let it grow, let it mature, and and uh, eventually this would grow and begin to produce uh, a navel orange, which is sweet, and and it began to make me think about when when God comes in your life, He changes you. He, cha- he changes you. And, and the fruit that you ought to bear ought to be different. In fact, in your old nature, the fruit that you bore was sour. It's when you're grafted in the vine that something begins to change inside of you and the fruit produced in your life then becomes sweet and enjoyable and edible, not only to the world around you, but to your Heavenly Father. The, the fruit of your life that becomes evident that something inside of you has changed because the identity of who you are has changed. Just by adding a little piece into that cro- cross-shaped hole. When someone receives Christ in their life, just, a, just one drop of blood changes you. That's metaphorical. We're not sprinkling blood on people and it's spiritual. There's a spiritual change that begins to happen inside of you. And we talked about last week how, how the spirit is bigger, is more, is more than the physical. That the physical actually reflects the spiritual. So how does this change you? That when you abide in him and he in you, you will bear much fruit. And my prayer for you is that in your life, in your relationship with Jesus, that your life starts to bear fruit in ways that not are on your own control or your condition, but your life is lived by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. So the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit are in your life. And the fruit of your life begins to be uh, honored and glorified to God and is only produced by the Spirit. It's nothing you can do on your own. So this morning, if you're here in this place and you have never had a relationship with God, I would encourage you to cry out to God and and pray and ask Him to come inside your life. Let Him him lead you. Let Him guide you. Say, God, I surrender to you. I acknowledge your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins. For me, to give me new life, to restore me to new hope. I'm going to begin a relationship with you. It's simple. It's not a formula. And then if you've been a Christian, you've invited Christ in your life for a while, maybe there's something inside of you that needs to change, something inside of you that needs to come alive, something inside of you that needs to feel, feel the refreshment of the Holy Spirit, something inside of you that needs to start bearing fruit. And let me tell you, some of you need to hear the words, you need to go. 
Like there's a going aspect. There's a doing aspect. There's a there's a working aspect. There's a there's a there's a plowing aspect. There's a there's a producing aspect of your faith. Some of you also need to hear the words rest. Be filled. So this morning I'm just praying that in your faith journey that you begin to know who Christ says, who God says, sees you as, and who you are in him. That things begin to shift, that you no longer have to struggle the same way as you once did, that your life will begin to bear much fruit. We want to pray over you and just bless you as you head out to whatever your week looks like or unfolds, but you do it in a different way, that you do it knowing that you're saved, and you do it knowing who you are in Christ, that he has a plan and purpose for your life to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. God, I pray right now to everyone in this room and watching online, I pray, God, that you would bless them. I pray, God, that this week would be a little bit different, that we would we would heed your word, that we would memorize your word, that we would say it over and over again, that we are a new creation. We're new. We're new. We're new in Christ. God, I pray that you'd help us to think new, that you'd help us to believe new, that you'd help us to, to believe your word and trust your word and begin to see the opportunities to share the good news to those around of us, to around us, to be to, to let others begin to see the fruit or the evidence of your, your hand working in our lives lives around us. God, help us to be more patient. Help us to be more kind. Help us to be more loving. Help us to be more forgiving. Help us to be more generous. God, help us to be to be, to be more like you in the circumstances and situations around us. Help us to, to, to be strong and courageous when we need to be strong and courageous. Help us to defend the weak. Help us, God, to do the things you've called us to. Lord, I thank you, God, for, for much fruit in this room. In Jesus' name. Guys, thanks so much for joining us this week. We pray that you are blessed and have a great week. We'll see you again next time.